I'm going to talk to you today about a book that we have done and is coming out in December called The End of Illness. Um, this is something that I've been passionate about, working on for the last several years, and it really comes from my 20 plus years treating cancer. And it's the old adage that in order to understand peace, you have to go to war. So 20 years treating cancer and seeing the ravage that does to the system that is the human body, we brought all that back to model general health. And I'm going to tell you some of the tenets today and certainly what I believe going forward in proposing a new model for health and showing how one can apply that to one's own life and then ending up with technology, how that fits in and how in my mind it brings hope to the feeling of health and to where we're all going with our own health. So what is health? You know, originally we titled the book, What is Health? And then I received an email from Steve Jobs. And Steve said, when you put health in the title of anything, it makes me feel like I'm eating Brussels sprouts, <laughs> which is classic Steve. And Steve actually helped came up with the title, The End of Illness, which I believe in, is declarative, is aggressive. But it's this notion of the Brussels sprouts, I think, which scares me and scares everybody. And so the notion of health, that there are certain things that are good and bad, that there's this binary function, yes, no, I think some of which I'll try to disprove you today. So Mark Twain had a different definition of health. Obviously, also not the most positive of definitions in this quote. But again, we want to change that notion going forward. So the big question with health is, what's your metric? Is it your cholesterol? Is it your weight? Is it how you feel? Is it how much you slept? Is it your, your bank account? What is health? And what is your metric there? So take, for example, growth hormone. A billion plus sales last year, over 400,000 prescriptions, the vast majority for people in the sixth and seventh decade of age who want to look better and feel better. But I guarantee you those people don't know about a study that was published in Science Magazine this year about a group down in South America who have a mutation in that pathway. And they never get cancer and they never get diabetes. In fact, many organisms, if you alter that pathway and you grow slower, they live much longer. So why would people make a conscious decision to take a drug that may promote these diabetes, cancer, et cetera, and in every randomized study actually make people live shorter because their metric is different, right? Their metric is I want to look better, feel better today. And I think the key is know your own metric because all of us not just want to live until our 90s, but actually want to be healthy and quality of life till our 90s going forward. Well, the only way to do that is to avoid disease. I will tell you, being on the front lines of cancer, that we're not very good at treating it. And every week, I unfortunately lose patients to this horrible disease. So the way to treat cancer is avoid it. And the, the paradox here is that if you make people live till their 90s, you probably will reduce health care costs. If you look at all of the data, when people are in their 90s, they don't go on a ventilator at the end of life. They don't spend weeks to months in an intensive care unit. They die with dignity from whatever process ails them at that point. In fact, something I learned actually last week is 1951 was the last year you could put old age on a death certificate. The, um, uh, but, but the notion of lowering healthcare costs is key. You know, I mentioned this, I was in Abu Dhabi last week at the World Economic Forum meeting, and I, I showed some of this data. And one of the health ministers um, from uh, one of the European countries came up and said, David, you can't do this. It's gonna bankrupt the world. I go, what do you mean? He goes, pensions are built so that certain number of people die in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And if you make people live longer, you're gonna screw up the world pension systems. So I just responded that with global warming, the bio calamities happening will take the place of disease. Um, but uh, uh, obviously, the goal is to live longer. We have to think in that regard. So where do we go wrong in healthcare? In my mind, it's infectious disease. We got fooled. So antibiotics came along, and they worked. They were diagnosis-centric. You identify the organism, you give the right antibiotic, it will work no matter if the host is big, tall, short, fat, round, green, it doesn't matter. You identify that organism. The problem is disease is not like that. In fact, Haldane in the 20s was prophetic in that he announced we're gonna screw up heart disease, cancer, and other areas because of infectious disease, and he was right. 
The diagnosis requires understanding the system, who the host is for everything, because those diseases are within, they're not without. And so if you look at the death rate in our country, we've had dramatic impact in many diseases. In fact, I showed this same slide two years ago at TED Med, and I got hundreds of negative emails about it. People were aggressive and mean. And they said, this can't be true. Or you guys are screwing up, and there's a collusion out there for cancer so that drug companies can make more money. Every answer you can get was in these emails. Unfortunately, it's the real data, right? Uh, a vaccine's anti-infective work beautifully for viruses and many bacteria. Certainly, the statins, stopping smoking and aspirin, dramatic effects that I'll show you in the heart diseases. But other diseases, we haven't made much of an impact. Parts is, we're a complex system, right? You've got an input and you've got an output. The input is what you eat. The input is how you live. The input is your genetics. The output is how you feel. And there's a state system in the middle that right now we can't comprehend, we can't quantify, and we're not quite sure what it is. But if you think of disease as a complex system, it's a different way of approaching disease. The bad news is it's almost impossible to understand complex emergent systems. The good news is if I ask you how to stop a train, you tell me pull the brake. And if that brake is strong enough, it'll work. You don't have to know every force. You don't have to know everything about the track. You don't have to know everything about the friction. That force is great enough, it'll work. So we can control complex emergent systems we don't necessarily understand, and that's one of the premises going forward. The problem is my business was built to help people. We, in fact, said the Hippocratic Oath when we got our medical school degree. The problem is, is that we didn't always do that. And if you look at what we push, what we talk about, what we promote, it's not always based on data. And so one of the theses of the book, of everything I believe in, is that always question. Because most of the time, it's not based on true data. Remember, my profession is the one that pushed margarine in the 80s. How many millions of lives were lost in this country from eating margarine and not butter with regard to atherosclerotic disease? Certainly scary. Another premise where we push things is, is exercise. We say, do your hour of aerobics every day, right? Spend your time with your trainer, go to your gym, do your hour of aerobics, and then sit at your desk the rest of the day. Turns out we were probably wrong. In an amazing study published in 1953 in the journal Lancet, Morris, one of the first people to publish in this area, and really the only one to do so for a period of about 40-something years, showed that in the British transit system, where there were 23,000 employees, half were the bus drivers and half were the conductors. The conductors are the one who took the tickets on those double-decker buses. So the bus drivers sat there for greater than 90% of the day, and the ticket takers walked. The heart deaths in the ticket takers was dramatically lower than the bus drivers. The same was true when you looked at telephone, as people answered the telephone and sitting all day versus postmen. Dramatic difference both in heart disease and cancer. And in this 1953 paper, there's an amazing chart where he put on profession and death risk. And you can see things like gardeners with the lowest and things like secretarial pool with the highest because they were sitting. Remember, your lymphatics in your body don't have muscles around them. It's the contraction of your legs that actually pushes things around in the body. So I got one of those accelerometers at TED Med two years ago, and I realized I was sitting for most of the day in front of my desk. And I got one of those phones where I can walk around my office and lower the amount of time I was sedentary by close to 45%, which again, can translate to health issues going forward. You know, I was at one of the pharmaceutical companies and they were showing me proud of their new building and the parking spaces right there. They could, someone could pull in and walk right to their floor. And I said, you know, if it were me, I would make people park three buildings over and walk three buildings to work. That's a hell of a statement, and there's a return on investment to your bottom line in that regard. So worldwide life expectancy is certainly getting better, right? How are we going to get it to the next level? There are diseases out there that we're all dying from, and if you look at non-communicable diseases now in the third world, they're one of the major causes of death all of a sudden. In fact, the United Nations, for the first time in several decades, had a meeting on non-communicable diseases in September. So all of a sudden, it's become dominant in our world. What's going to change this is technology. You look at things like uh, uh, sequencing. In the 1970s, $150 million to sequence a gene. 
When I go home at night, I can sequence 100 genes in a patient of mine for dollars, and I could use it the next day to help guide that patient. So this is me. I mean, these are my Navigenics uh, DNA results. This is my future, my DNA. This is where we have to go is pushing this technology. The issue is it's not all in the genes, right? Every disease we talk about here, there's an environmental component and a genetic component. The environmental component is modulatable by all of us. It's what we eat, how we live, where we go, our lifestyle. The genetics obviously is there. Well, if we're a society and we're doing in the United States healthcare reform, which I argue is not healthcare reform, it's healthcare finance reform, which doesn't really in the long run help many of us at all, we look at something like aspirin. So this data on aspirin, five years you can lower GI cancers by 54%, the number three killer in cancers. After 20 years, decrease the death of lung cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, esophageal cancer. Why isn't this mandatory? Why should society pay for these diseases when we're older, when we could take a drug that costs almost nothing and prevent them? So sure, you make it optional, but you have to pay a higher health care cost. Remember, Michael Dell was a hero. He said at Dell, if you smoke, you pay two times the health insurance cost. He lost 2% of his workforce the first year. After several years, he brought down costs. We need to bring back culpability to the health care system. You look at statins. They were developed to inhibit an enzyme to make LDL, cholesterol. Turns out that they probably work dominantly by blocking inflammation. The Jupiter study showed that if you had normal cholesterol and you took statins, you delay heart attack and stroke by a significant many years. Statins reduce the incidence of cancer by double-digit percentages. So again, why should statins be optional? Statins should be mandatory or pay a penalty because society has to bear the healthcare costs of not taking these preventive uh, methods. Then there's the other side, the causal, going back to our Hippocratic Oath. 39,000 women followed for 19 years, published this year in the uh, uh, Archives of Internal Medicine. When they looked at who took multivitamins, B6, folic acid, magnesium, zinc, copper, and iron, there was a significantly double-digit higher death rate when they did. Even though the women who took these vitamins were actually healthier going in and low body mass index, higher death rate with vitamins, scary. These uh, 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 headlines were all in the last two years you could find on the internet with vitamin D. Apparently, it cures everything. <laughs> Yet there has never been in the history of man or womankind a randomized study showing a benefit to this. In fact, 97% of African Americans, 75% of Caucasians low in vitamin D. So first of all, who defined what is low and what is normal? I didn't come with an instruction book. So it calls into question what is normal in that regard. Hip fracture rate in the United States is declining over the last two decades, yet there's a new epidemic of vitamin D deficiency. If you give women, and this is 2,256 women, high dose of vitamin D, you increase the rate of bone fractures by 26%, not decrease them. And so we look at data like this. Um, we look at vitamin E in the select study, 34,000 men. It cost our government over $200 million to do this study with the idea that it would prevent prostate cancer. And the lure out there among docs was, give people vitamin E, it's going to prevent prostate cancer. And they were all doing it. So finally, somebody did a randomized study. After three years, increased incidence of prostate cancer. After seven years, 17% higher incidence of the most dominant cancer in men besides skin cancer. The recommended daily allowance is 22 international units. Why would you ever think that taking 400 international units is better than that? Certainly calls into questions the things we're doing. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality looked at 63 randomized studies, um, randomized controlled studies with vitamins. None showed a benefit on heart disease and cancer. The Caret study in 2004 among smokers, when former smokers, 18,000 of them, showed a 28% higher mortality rate in, uh, from lung cancer in the patients who took the supplements. 17% higher overall mortality. So why are we taking these things? Why shouldn't we penalize people who do if society has to pay the health care costs? Remember, health care is 16% of GDP in our country at the present time. Proteomics, one of the technologies I think will be one of the changes in healthcare. 1976, if your doctor thought you were pregnant, 
They took a tube of blood from you and injected it into a rabbit. This is 1976. Every hospital in the country had a rabbit war. Five days later, they would look at the ovaries of these rabbits. If they were larger, you were pregnant. All of a sudden, a proteomic test came along called the pregnancy test. For $10, you can get a rapid response without killing a rabbit and know if one was pregnant or not and dramatically affect health care. Uh, 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 death rates went down. People took prenatal vitamins. Things did better in that regard. Proteomics is looking at that state function in the middle that I just told you about when we looked at the complex system. So we can now, from a drop of blood, get that 60 gigabyte profile of all the proteins in the blood, and that's what you're seeing here. Well, what's next? So there are tenfold more bacteria and viruses in each of us than cells in the human body. So they control how we metabolize our food. They control our hormone levels. They control how our complex system works. Well, for the first time, we have the technology to actually look at them, quantify them, and probably manipulate them over the next several years. In fact, if you look at incidents of breast cancer and prostate cancer in China, it's about a tenth of what ours is. After a decade of moving here, there starts to approach ours. We always said it's the freaking Burger King and McDonald's. It turns out it's not. It's the microbiome. It's how we metabolize the food that we eat that does that. And so this is where things are going to go forward, is we're going to start to understand this complex system and control this complex system. And so I'm certainly honored to be here and start this off. And I gave you snippets today. The book has all of the data in it. And I know many of you will argue it, but you can see all the primary sources in the data and we'll put forward. So I thank you very much for your indulgence.